It's 7 a.m. Suddenly, the house is filled with the sound of the doorbell ringing and aggressive pounding. Next, you hear, FBI, open up! Before you know it, you're surrounded by a SWAT team pointing M16s at you and your family. That's exactly what Catholic dad Mark Houck faced last fall. All of this for protecting his son from a Planned Parenthood escort's verbal abuse six months prior. What's going on here? And how has the story developed since that day? We'll get into all of that on today's episode of the Edify podcast. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mary. Good to be with you. Take us back to that day when the FBI SWAT team came to your door. What happened? Walk us through that morning. Uh, Well, I was already up. I got up around six o'clock and uh, it was a co-op day for our homeschool. So we're leaving the home to go be with other students. And it's a great day. It's a fun day for the family. So I'm up early because I'm trying to get a breakfast going for the kids. I got a quiche in the oven. It's about 6.30, 6.45 when that heavy bang uh, startles me and, and you know, it alerts the whole family. The kids are, were, were sleeping. The seven children were all sleeping. My wife was barely stirring as I gently woke her up before I went downstairs to get the coffee going. And uh, yeah, the heavy bang um, uh, was at the door and I, I went to the door and I asked them to announce themselves because they actually didn't announce it was the FBI. They just said, mm. open up. Yeah. Um, and then when I, I asked them to announce themselves, they said, it's the FBI, open up. And they were like real urgent about it. Hurry up, hurry up, as if they were going to bust down my door. So I said, wow. stay calm, stay calm. I have seven babies in here. Stay calm. I'm about to open up the door. Right. And what's the age range of your children? Yeah. At that time, my youngest was two. My oldest was 13. Yeah. So little kids. Yeah, sure. For sure. Little, very impressionable children. I mean, they wake up to M16 guns pointed at them. I mean, that's as traumatic as it can get. Right. And so, um, so what happened next? So they didn't break down the door. You opened it for them after they identified themselves as law enforcement? That's right. So they would have if I w- if I was upstairs or I was sleeping, they probably would have. But I was there, so I think I I think I took them by surprise that that I opened the door so quickly. And cuz the reaction when I came out the door was a bit of shock on their part. Um it was, I was shocked to see what I saw. I saw at least 10 marked and unmarked units parked in my grass surrounding my home lined up all the way down the driveway. I had at least five agents on my porch with M16 guns pointed at me, ballistic helmets, ballistic shields, uh, heavily armored vests, so the two battering rams, and then all the PA state troopers litter around the property uh, behind their doors pointing pistols at me. My daughter takes note of of two two, uh, agents at the back door, SWAT guys with guns pointed uh, into the door. And, uh, and, and we have multiple entrances, so I don't know how many more. I'm going to say at least 20 plus federal agents and PA state troopers on the property. Wow. So this is like, like a criminal minds episode where they're breaking <laughs> into some serial killer's house to arrest them. I, I don't even know what that is, but I mean, that's, sounds- what I, that's what conjures up in my mind as yeah. I hear you describe this. Right. Right. It, it was beyond imagination. It was surreal. I asked them what they were doing there because I, I had no clue that they were there with anything related to that incident, which was acquitted uh, in in, uh, in state PA state court. I had no idea that that's why they were there. Right. So okay. So let's let's take a step back. What happened in front of that clinic six months earlier? In front of that Planned Parenthood abortion clinic? Well, it almost was a full year earlier. It was October thirteenth, twenty twenty one. And this was September 23rd, 2022, when the raid came. So on that day, um, I was there with my son as usual, uh, praying peacefully on the sidewalk about 50 feet from the entrance to Planned Parenthood. Uh, We were just ministering to the men and women going by. And of course, that's what we do. We've always done for 20 years. Uh, As two girls came out, I escorted them to the Pregnancy Resource Center nearby. Uh, I was over 100 feet away from the building. Um, an escort started to run over to try to intercept me. And oh, he successfully did that uh, and, and, dis- and forced me to disengage with the girls. So I knew this guy, I've known him for years. And he, you know, he, he kind of got uh, in my face as to, you know, uh, you know what, what, why I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Um, and then uh, proceeded to go back into the building and play in Parenthood. About 20 minutes later, he comes out and he makes a beeline for my 12-year-old son. 
and uh, stands right next to him, which of course he's allowed to do, but kind of awkward, you know, like there's a yeah. ton of room on the sidewalk. You're 150 feet from the entrance to the building. Yeah. What kind of man is picking on a kid? You know, yeah, right. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just an, a bad situation. Like you don't right. violate his personal space, but they never do that anyway. They're always at the doorway, the entrance. So, um, but on this day, it was different. My son has interacted with him before. I've, in, I've known the guy for 20 years. Uh, he's the most aggressive escort at Planned Parenthood. And, uh, but on this day, he's usually badgering me. Uh, this day was different. He was badgering my son and he kept coming after him and he started talking to him about me and how evil his father was just as I was there. And, you know, of course he's really uncomfortable with this and you know, course, like, your dad sure. hates women. Uh, and just badgering, badgering, harassing. And I said, man, you right. got to stop, man. Just, just leave the kid alone. Go back to where did, you did. Anybody get this, Mark? Did anybody get this on on tape? Did anybody film this from their phone? The whole thing was well. I don't know if the audio. The whole thing was filmed by Planned Parenthood. I mean, it's it, you can see the interaction where he stands next to my son. I don't know of anyone that got it outside of that of that footage, um, but but Planned Parenthood had all the footage. So uh, I don't think there's any audio, but um, yeah. So I said, get, just go back where you normally stand. And, uh, and actually I, I escorted him back and he complied with that. So thinking everything is settling down, he, I turned around to be with my son. And of course he wheels around and comes right back at my son again. So at that point I wasn't like pro-life activist. I was just dad. I was just dad like, hey, leave my boy. I pushed the guy, right? He fell down and that was, uh, that was the genesis of, of the uh, of the trial, essentially. Right. So that was that was the state trial in criminal court, correct? Or was that a civil suit in in state court? It was a private criminal complaint. So no one in the state, like it wasn't the DA or Philadelphia PD or civil affairs, or they weren't coming after me from on that level. Right. So you weren't charged by like the state's attorney. No, no, no. I was. It was a, a private criminal, criminal violation. Complaint. If you okay. have an issue with somebody, you can put them in a private criminal complaint, like a, a okay. restraining order. So that had been resolved and you were found not guilty, correct? Right. I, it was dismissed because he didn't even bother showing up for court. Right. So there was no evidentiary hearing. It no. never went to trial. He never showed up and the thing, the whole thing got dismissed. Exactly. Exactly. Five okay. days so later, then, I'm served a target letter at the same street corner. Okay. And what did that letter say? So a plainclothes agent came up to me it's on the same, the Wednesday, you know, following that uh, dismissal. I was with my son again, same exact spot where the incident occurred. Uh, and he said, here you go. You're Mark Halk. Yes, here you go. And uh, it said, you're a target of a federal grand jury investigation. Have your attorney contact our offices right away. You're under potential indictment against the FACE Act. Right, which is the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Correct. Act. Right. So your lawyer, Peter Breen, or one of your lawyers um, from the Thomas More Society, and others representing you made it clear that you would turn yourself in and that they would present you, uh, that they would present you for questioning, correct? That's right. Matt Heffron, former federal prosecutor, Thomas More Society, contacted uh, Anita Eve, Assistant U.S. Attorney, U.S. Justice Department, Eastern District, and said, my client's innocent. You have case law in your own district against indicting him. However, should you want to indict him, no need to bring an agent out to his house He's a peaceful man. We'll bring him to you. Just give us a call. Uh, oh, and by the way, you can pick him up every Wednesday on the street where you, you served him the target letter. Right. So you were. They gave him uh, gave the the DA multiple yes. opportunities um, right. to either have you present yourself uh, willingly, sure, or be picked up right. willingly right. in front of the clinic where you were at, where you prayed every week. Right. Every Wednesday. Right. So I think in any reasonable person's mind, absolutely no reason to show up at your house with 20 agents yeah. with M16. For yeah, sure. It's a bit, For so, sure. Yeah. And so, um, so listeners, just to emphasize what was at stake for Mark personally here, he was facing 11 years in prison, a $350,000 fine, and then three years of supervised probation. So, and in federal trials, um, the feds almost always win. Like right. federal prosecutors bag about 98% of the cases right. that they take. Because they don't take to trial something they know they, they're not going to exactly. win. So Mark, you, in your Edify video, and listeners will link to that below, to Mark's excellent Edify video, your situation really you know, crystallizes what is an example of what we are now calling lawfare, which is using the legal system and legal proceedings to intimidate 
or to hinder an opponent or an enemy. So it, it's, a, it's a way of trying to silence people who are whatever disagreeing with the zeitgeist of the day or the current administration. I mean, these are like, you know, communist tactics. I mean, this feels like communist Poland to me, you know, under the occupation um, in the 1980s, when you saw all those kind of very similar things happening, the police being weaponized against the people it was supposed to be serving. Yeah, we had people that uh, were in Poland and, and part of our co-op say, hey, this is what they did to our parents. I was just gave oh, a talk. That's yeah. really interesting. I just gave a talk here in Florida and there was a woman from Austria and she she had to almost walk out of the talk because it was bringing back so much about what happened in Austria back in the 1940s. It's heartbreaking because, you know, you have that statue of Lady Justice, right? Blindfolded with the scales. It's mm. It is not supposed to look at people or their background or their beliefs. It's supposed to simply apply laws to facts, right? And if you, so you were 50 feet away from the entrance to the clinic, That's right. correct? That's right. So how could you, I, I'm, I'm just as a lawyer having trouble um, understanding <laughs> how they're charging you with a face fact violation. So you were responding to a direct threat against your child. Correct. Which is not covered by the face act as far as I'm aware. How did your lawyers go about defending you in this action? Right. Well, initially, again, Matt Heffron, former federal prosecutor, had case law and was presenting that to the AUSA saying, don't waste your time. Like, this is not a winnable case. Well, of course, you know, they were moving forward. Um, we got Brian McMonagle, local attorney in Philadelphia. We asked Jesse Barrett to be Amy Coney Barrett's husband, to be our attorney. He said, no, you want Brian McMonagle in Philadelphia. Oh, so Brian's yeah. our defense attorney. And, uh, you know, the, his strategy was to demonstrate that my child was scared. And, of course, he was. And, uh, yeah, and we had to, he's 12 years old. Yeah. We <laughs> had know, to, I mean, for goodness right, sake. Right. And so, um, you know, as he reviewed the case with me, he's like, this is this is a no brainer. You know, you're you're protecting your son. Um, you know, there were no women involved. So they were like. There were no even abortion minded women coming or even going. It was just between. Right. It's a dispute between two guys on the street of Philadelphia, which frankly is happens every day in Philadelphia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, any big city, right. You know, you're right. going to have these kind of, and normally the, the response of the police is to deescalate these kind of situations. Sure. Sure. Not to escalate them by sending the FBI to the house. So, okay. So let's go, let's, let's go back to your house. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm sorry to even ask you to relive this for sure. me, but no, I think fine. it's important for listeners to know. Tell me about the reactions of your children. Well, look, they were woken from a, a, a slumber, a, a good night's rest. They always wake up on that Friday very excited. Uh, right. They woke up to just scary noises, fear, volume. And then guns pointed at them. They were lined up on my steps. At the children. So they were pointing guns at the children. So so yeah, you have to know at my house, I have a double door. When it's open, the steps are right there. So the children right. were lined up on the steps because my son was keeping them there. Actually, one of my daughters slipped down and was at the back door but um, where the two SWAT guys were. So she had those guys looking at her with the barrels of their gun. But what happened Here, is Lord. once I opened the door, then they put their guns in the threshold of the doorway to scan the room, right? To, that's what they do. And then my children, of course, are in the line of fire. So um, they're screaming and they're yelling. And my wife's like, please stay calm because she came down and, and started to address the FBI. Do you have a warrant for his arrest? No, we're taking him with or without a warrant. That's what the FBI said. Wow. So she said, you can't do that. That's kidnapping at gunpoint. That's what she said. Yeah, well, yeah. right. Yeah. And how they don't have a warrant. And so your wife, Ryan Marie, sounds like she was incredibly composed. I've read other accounts of oh, this. She took control of the situation. Yeah, what a grace God gave her. Yeah, no, there was grace. But she had an awareness that I didn't have because I was in shock. And then uh, she said, you can't do that. It's kidnapping at gunpoint. They did have a warrant, but they, it was not presented until I was in custody. Oh, until I was in custody, they tore off the front of the cover sheet and handed it to my wife. Because my wife said, you got to give me something. You can't take my husband. She was right. resistant. And uh, eventually they, they complied. But, you know, I, I, it's like, why wouldn't you present that first thing? Unless you want something bad to happen. Well, I mean, uh, you know, you should. Again, the whole point is to take, if, if there is a need to take someone into custody, that you do it peacefully. You right. don't escalate the situation. Right. If, if you can't, certainly if there are children involved, 
you never put them in harm's way, right? I mean, sure. innocent children. Um, so, I mean, good on your wife for standing her ground and I'm sure her, all her maternal instincts were, were yes, kicking in as well. Sure. What was the time frame? How long did this all take from the time you heard the pounding on the door until the time you were taken into custody? Well, it seemed like forever, but when you watch the dash cams, it was probably no more than three to four minutes before I was in their custody. But in that three to four minutes, there was a lot of exchanges of, of commentary, mostly me to them. Uh, and, and my wife to them. They, they really didn't have a lot to say. Uh, they patted me down. I don't think I was even read my Miranda rights. I, I just said, what do you want me to do? Like, can I get some clothes on now? Uh, they didn't let you put clothes on. No, I had a shirt, a t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops. And oh it's cold. September 23rd is cold outside. Uh, right. They wouldn't let me put socks on. They wouldn't let me put deodorant on. They wouldn't let me say goodbye to my children. Um, then they just were taking you kind of thing. And, and very quickly, within about four minutes, as my wife disappeared, because she was a bit of an obstacle to them um, to take care of the children, they, they, right. they cuffed me and put me in the car. In the, in the right. Evening. And and it's fairly clear, even from these kind of, you know, 10,000 feet observations, you were not a threat to yourself. Uh, you were oh, not sure. a, certainly not a threat to them in your shorts and your T-shirt and your flip flops. Right. <laughs> um and so I just, this is just an extraordinary to, to hear all of this. Um, and, you know, you, I, I'm not accusing you of making it up, but if I just heard this just as a regular, I don't know, you know, law school class or whatever, I would say, you've got to be making that up. That could not possibly happen in the United States for somebody who was simply praying outside a clinic. Let's just go back to your, you've been a clinic, um, you've been praying in front of clinics for a, a personal prayerful witness there for many years. Um, tell me how you got involved in doing that in the first place. Sure. Well, I was 28 years old when I, when I was kind of convicted by my mother about the pro-life, you know, issue and, and, and just understanding what, what's involved and my role in it. And so I eventually volunteered my time with a, a pro-life organization that's in the Philadelphia area that spoke to young people about chastity and, and pro-life work. And, uh, and so we would, they invited me to, to be a part of, of their efforts and we would join prayer vigils. This was back in 2003. So I've been doing it for 20 years. Eventually I became a full-time uh, employee for that organization called Generation Life. And uh, for three plus years, I, I, I spoke to kids in the classroom about the virtue of chastity, how it's the foundation for building a culture of life, and, and I did weekly activism. So that was the beginning. I learned how to sidewalk counsel through that. I learned how to you know, minister to people that are in crisis, de-escalate. And then eventually I started my own ministry in 06 that continued to do the same thing, but with a focus on men and their role in all of this. Okay. So that's your ministry, the, all the king's men? The king's men, right. The king's men. Okay. Yeah. And where does that come from, that reference? Uh, what all the king's men? The king's men. The name. Where did where did you come oh, up with the name? I started with Ardvark in the dictionary, and I I got to see, and I was just asking God to give me uh, a name for a men's ministry, and I got to Christ, and I just thought Christ the King, and I thought, okay, what can we unite under? We can all unite under that banner. So I said, right. all the king's men, like you did, and I said, now that's Humpty Dumpty. I said, well, how about just the king's men? And so, right. um, yeah, it's stuck, and, and that's what we called ourselves. I figured you were referring to Christ the King, but you, yeah, know, yeah, you never yeah. know. You always want to just kind of clarify. Yeah, yeah. Um, but t tell me s some of the things that your, your men's ministry does and how, I mean, this is, I think, an age of, of many men, especially men in their 20s, you know, who are gravitating to people like Jordan Peterson and others because they don't have good masculine role models. Right. How do you yourself define masculinity? How do you model it for the men in your ministry? What do you do to help them to appreciate sure. their, and not be ashamed of their own masculine gifts? Yeah, for sure. Well, look, the, the culture has feminized most men. And um, we have a bunch of men that are, uh, you know, not really clear on what their roles are. And so for us, we, you know, we have men's groups all around the country. So that's some of what we do is we bring men together to, to further form them. Uh, they're lacking formation, not only in their Catholic formation, but they're, they're just lacking in their their masculine formation. And so then we take them on retreats and we invite men to learn more about these things. And we identify uh, three key areas, charisms, if you will, that women have, but, but, but in, much, in, in a very real sense, it's, it's very proper to a man in the sense of 
uh, you know, his call and Adam in the gardens. So we say lead, protect, provide, leader, protector, provider. And so we outline these for men and, and we try to educate them on how to be a better leader, how to be a better protector, how to be a better provider. And so those are the core kind of elements of what we do and everything's united under that banner. And then we call men to take their faith to action. So we kind of bring them in, we help them form in that identity, and then we send them out. It kind of sounds like Christ, right? shape them and then send them, you know? And so that's what we did, you know, and that's what we continue to do. And we're all over the country and, you know, abortion fighting abortion. We've been a part of the closing of 22 sexually oriented businesses just by praying outside of these places because pornography is such a, 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 a pandemic in the world. And, um, you know, it's just something we have to deal with. So we help men with that too. Yeah, that's, you know, and that is a growing problem. And we've addressed that with other Edify videos, um, the, the scourge that is pornography yeah. and particular how it's warping, you know, men and warping their expectations of women and just warping the entire marriage and mating market, oh, sure. right. Yeah. In, in the United States. And, um, there was just a, a recent study that came out that showed that men in their forties who are not married and don't have a family yet suffer much higher rates of depression oh. on average than, than other men do. Um, it. and right. Because they, it's, for whatever reason, it, it seems to trap men in their 20s and, mm -hmm. and they don't mature and they don't, you know. Yeah, the rest um, of development. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So that's a well, how did the other men in the King's Men uh, react when you were arrested and then taken into custody? I imagine they were a powerful prayer force for you. But was there anything else that they did to help, you know, um, to help your family during that time? And, yeah, and you know, we all we all have a band of brothers, you know, and I have my own band of brothers in my area. And, and of course, nationally, everyone was praying and, and the men yes. were praying and asking. You were on many a prayer chain. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I think I had like 12 different requests to pray for you from 12 different groups. Oh, so yeah. you oh, were yeah. covered in prayer for sure. Oh, we were coded. And so these, you know, these men were there for me, uh, you know, not only to, to support my family, uh, you know, while I would be away, because they assured me. Hey, if you, we were going to be there for your family. If you were put away like the January 6th people were put away and waiting trial, we would have been there. We'd have taken care of they, So you they weren't released waiting trial. trial. You, were kept, you were kept in jail pending your trial. No, no. I was released that same day. Uh, you were? There, okay. On my own recognizance. So that tells you I wasn't a violent yes. offender. I wasn't a flight risk or a uh, uh, what violent offender, flight risk, or threat to the community. So they right. already knew uh, they were going to release me that day. When they okay, came. so this was really all from the from the get go. You sensed this. This was all about the theatrics. It was oh, not yeah. about uh, the safety of the community. It was not about the safety of your family. Yeah, it, it was about nothing but making sure, making sure that you knew that if you kept up your pro life advocacy, the the and and I think a message to anybody who works in pro life, right? You keep this up, and this is what could happen to you. We're coming after you. Look, I learned that the process was the punishment and is in our in our two tier right. justice system. Like they don't know who they they came after. I I don't know how much they knew about me, but as far as I'm concerned, like they didn't realize the resolve of of just the man they were dealing with. Not that that patting myself on the back, but like it only emboldened me. Right? You know, it, right. it's not something that they intimidate, scared my children. They scared pro life America. But I looked at it as like, hey, I'm doing something right, you know. Yes. If they're coming right. after me, I must be. I must be doing something right. So. Right. Well, um, yeah, the Biden administration. I think they've made this very clear. Whether it's through what happened to you or the FBI infiltrating certain Latin mass communities, right? Um, that certain kinds of Catholics are their target, and you don't have to even be an activist. Just if you're a certain kind of Catholic, that's right. You know, you're on their radar. But you know, so we've talked. We've kind of alluded to this, but tell me about some of the spiritual side of this. Um, you speak so impressively about it. What are some of the spiritual fruits for you and your family personally that, that came out of this? We know God makes all things work together for the good. How, how did this work for the good for you and your family? Well, good. That's a great question. And, and, and it's the one that's really compelling to everybody, I think, because uh, look, it was a spiritual journey. Um, knowing that you were being arrested for a just cause, a righteous cause, I mean, that's the Beatitudes, right? That's blessed are the persecuted for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? And so you go right into that. Like you are literally in that Beatitude. 
So um, no, you can reject that or ignore that. But for me, that was that was everything. Um, when I got arrested, I had perfect peace, knowing that that uh, you know that like the apostles coming out of the upper room and being thrown into prison. That that I rejoiced being being able to suffer for the name of Jesus. Right. I yeah. had been saying yes to martyrdom for 20 years, not only as a married man dying to myself, but in ministry life, you know, learning to do that every day. So when they, not, when they banged on my door, I was willing to say yes to that. I can't say my children were because they're there, they, they hadn't been preparing for that. But the journey we took was, a one, was one of faith, and uh, it was powerful. It was, um, it was really beyond words, but I'll, I'll try to capture it. I mean, God took me... Uh, in four and a half months, my family and I on the journey of the way of the cross. It was my, our own personal Via Della Rosa. And, and we traveled those 14 stations all the way up to crucifixion, which was the trial date. And the Lord told me that this would be the way that you would understand it. But when I was chained to that table at the federal building for six hours, belly shackled, ankle shackled, I had, I had full knowledge that my will and God's will was perfectly one. And the church teaches and the, the saints get there, but most people don't get there till they on the brink of death, right? Where they just totally surrender their will to God and his. But for me, I knew I, my will was one with God, that I was like, hey, he, I was right where God wanted me to be. And so that gave me great peace, you know, and, and I, I had great joy in that. And so I, I, I you know, left the federal building with that in, uh, attitude. And, and of course, so, so if you were released on your own recognizance, right. why were you, why were you chained during your trial? That's a great question. Um, I'm in there. That, that I, does I, not make sense to I'm me. I'm in the federal building. Right. Uh, I'm fingerprinted and they take a mug shot. So then. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, all right? standard. But I'm in their custody. The driver thanks me. He tells me it was a real pleasure meeting me, which he had a lot of courage to do that because he recognized that I was an innocent man and. This is not right. But then they belly shackled me. They ankle shackled me, bare ankles, nice and tight on the, on the bone. And then they bring me to a white room with a ring on this table in it. And that's it. That's all that's in this eight by 10 room. They chain me to that table, cuff me to the table for six hours. And they check on me like every hour or two. And I think they wanted to enrage me. I think they wanted to see me get angry so they could use it against me. But I, 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 I was praying without ceasing. I, I had prayed every mystery of the rosary. I was in communion with uh, uh, the saints. And I was at the foot of the cross. I literally was at Calvary. And I could pluck a splinter right off the cross. And I think when people hear that, they, they just can't believe it. you know. But, but it was the invitation God gave me. And I just said yes to it. And uh, again, I didn't, I wasn't disturbed at all. Um, I wasn't, even if I was going away to prison. I feel like I'm, you know, reading through something in the Acts of the Apostles, just hearing you talk here. It's, it's like biblical and it's. Well, it was. Yeah. I said, if I went to prison, it would be for the best, right? Because God would bring good out of it. Not for my benefit, but for everyone involved, my family, that this would be, God would bring tremendous good out of this. And no matter what happened, because that's how good he is. So was it a jury trial or a bench trial? It was a jury trial. We asked for a bench trial because we liked the judge, uh, but they the prosecution didn't agree to it. So we had. So a jury were you trial. shackled in front of the jury? No, no. When I when the four and a half months later, no, I I, I showed up. Uh, there was no. I was not. Okay, in so they didn't have you. No. So you're currently running for Congress uh, to represent your home state of Pennsylvania. Had you ever wanted to run for public office before? No. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what, so what, what made you take this step? Did well, that's you just another, a moment where you said, okay, like I got to do this or. That's another journey of faith. So look, but even before my trial in January, people were asking me to run for office. I said, ah, I don't want to run for office. I have no desire to run for office. But then about, you know, 30 people, including my own attorney, all the way up to June of this year, were saying, you should consider running for office. And I said, geez, Samuel was asked three times by the Lord, you know, to come to him. And God had asked me 30 times before I would even consider it. So I took it to prayer at the, at the request of um, some, some people of influence. And uh, my wife and I prayed for signal graces the whole month of July, prayed to St. Padre Pio and asked for clear signs to run, that this be God's will. And uh, again, if that's what God wants, I'm all in. 
And so um, after the end of July, we said, yeah, this is what God wants. My wife confirmed it on her end. And then we just moved forward. We said, okay, if it's what God wants, you know, we're going to be held accountable if we, if we reject that. So right. um, that's right. why we, we decided. And we're, and we're all yeah, in and, and we're excited about it because we're excited to do the will of God. Right. Well, how's your campaign going? Well, look, it's grassroots. We got an incumbent in who's the only, listen to this narrative. He's the only congressman who's a former FBI agent. Oh, <laughs> so no So how kidding. about that? The guy that's challenging wow. him was the guy that was was uh, raided. Now, he, I voted for him three terms and four terms in a row. Uh, he never, never came out and helped me, supported me, yeah, didn't say anything that's too to bad. me. So um, we're not, it's not for malicious reasons, but um, but yeah, it's grassroots. He's got a war chest the size of... Uh, Hillary Clinton's war chest. So, you know, we got a lot, of do, lot to do, but if God wants it, uh, we're going to win. So, Well, just to, you know, paraphrase the book of Esther, I think you've been raised up for such a time as this. Amen so, to that. That's thank, on my thank campaign you for saying, side. Yeah, well, thank you for saying yes <laughs> to welcome. what you believe thank God you. is asking of you. Uh, one thing that you mentioned to our team before we recorded um, was that today we need not have the courage that our own founding fathers did in 1776, but the courage of 33 AD. Could you just... Huh. Leave our listeners by explaining what you mean by that, the courage of 33 AD. Yeah, look, we need to be first century Christians in the 21st century. And and that's something Bishop Joseph Strickland said, and I've parroted it ever since. And it's so true. Like, you know, the, the, they said that Jesus came into the world at, at the darkest time, and, and probably it was because he's the brightest light, you know, the, the light of the world, it would shine the brightest. But you know what they say, the end times, which some people argue that's what we're in, that the saints at the end times will will shine even more brightly than than the first witnesses to Jesus. So um, that said, that's where we're at. I believe that's where we're at in in our journey. And um, you know, we just have to say yes not only to the daily martyrdom, the white martyrdom that comes just from denying ourselves, but we got to say yes to the persecution. We got to say yes to the tyranny that is at our doors, that is coming after Catholics, that is coming after uh, people of faith. And um, not to be afraid, you know, we ju just have that holy boldness to say, yes, I'm going to follow Christ even into the fire and, uh, and he will meet me there. Well, thank you so much, not only for your witness, which you have so courageously given to so many Catholics, but also just for your day-to-day your -day witness as a father and as a husband and as a man who is completely submissive to God's will. You're, you're just such an inspiration to everyone, Mark, and we're so grateful that you could join us on the Edify Podcast. Oh, Podcast thank you, today. Mary. You, you, you're giving me goosebumps. God bless you. Thank you for listening. To make it easier for you to listen to future Edify Podcast episodes, please make sure you subscribe over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you.